Hey everybody, Doug Passan, clearly not in Studio 3553. It's um, Thursday night, uh, August 15th, and I wanted to do something a little different with this episode. We spend a lot of time talking about our successes on this podcast with other lawyers and other experts and even sometimes clients. And it's fun to do that. And it's educational to do that. And it's inspirational to do that because it gives you some sense of what is possible. But sometimes things go so horribly wrong in a case. And we have to talk about that too. And I don't have a guest tonight to talk about this, and I'm not gonna give names, I'm not gonna go into specifics, uh, but I'm gonna tell you a story about, I think, what might be the fucking worst sentencing result I have ever seen. Over a million Americans face sentencing every year, and it will be the most important day of their lives. But we don't fully understand the system, how broken it is and what we can do to make it better. I'm Doug Passan. I'm a 25-year criminal defense lawyer and a sentencing expert. My goal is to bring more awareness, more fairness, and more humanity to the sentencing process. So, are you ready? Then let's get set for sentencing. It's been a long day. I'm, I'm in Oklahoma, and I had the privilege of meeting with a really wonderful human being who's on death row, so I'm here working on one of his cases, but this is one of those moments, this is a job. For those of you who don't know about criminal defense lawyering, uh, and uh, we see it on TV and we hear all the bullshit about, hey, they're just here to find loopholes and get people off and get murderers free, and mostly that's a bunch of bullshit. Um, what we're doing is carrying the responsibility of human beings on our shoulders. And sometimes those human beings are innocent. Sometimes they've committed a crime. They've done something either completely horrible or completely stupid and it doesn't define them, but they're facing serious consequences. So, you know, there are high, high highs in this job and there are low, low lows. And I have not felt lower in a long time. And I thought to myself, maybe the only way to deal with that is to just go and, and have a conversation with myself, I suppose, but hopefully you're all listening. And um, I don't know, maybe you can chime in on the comments or respond. I know you've all, if you're a lawyer, you've had these moments, you've had similar stories. And if you're a client, you've suffered through this. And um, I don't know, if you're a judge, who cares? God love you. Because I do think most judges are good, fundamentally good people who are trying to do the right thing. Okay, you're like, okay, get to the point, Doug, what happened? So I'm gonna back you up, because this case has been going on for a couple of years. But because I do this podcast, people find me online and they hear about the things that we talk about on this podcast, the kind of advocacy that we want to occur in cases. And sometimes, you know, it's a it's a client or it's a concerned parent or sibling who says, I'm worried that, that my loved one has this case and it's not being handled correctly. And that's exactly how this client came to me. So I wasn't called upon to represent this client. I was called upon to consult in a case uh, because I do that. I do that a lot in cases all over the country. Sometimes lawyers bring me in to help them because they're talented enough to know that they need the help and their egos are in check enough to accept the help. And other times it's clients or their, like I said, their loved ones who fundamentally feel like they're getting bad representation. And that's what was happening in this case. This client was a young man who is on the autism spectrum, who was isolated and alone, who was uh, reeling from the death of his dad and the death of his dog. And his dog and his dad were probably the, only, were the closest things in his life. And they were both gone. 
And uh, he's online all the time, as many of my autism spectrum, many, most kids are nowadays, but definitely autism spectrum. And uh, he's on these chats and interacting with total strangers and he comes across a young person and they forge a friendship. Now, my client is 19 at the time. This person, this young person is 13, I think. And you'd say, well, what's a 19 year old talk doing online chatting up a 13 year old? And under ordinary circumstances, great question to ask. It's a little off, it's very off. Um, I would not be happy if I had a 13 year old who was chatting up a 19 year old. But first point is nobody was paying attention <laughs> to what either of these kids were doing. And second point is the 19 year old because of his autism spectrum disorder, because of his social deficits, because of his lack of executive functioning, this was a peer to him. It's a kid who's bullied, ostracized in school, who's very, very immature, who's got a developmental disability. You understand what I mean when I say that? A developmental disability is not developing in the way that a neurotypical person is developing. And if you do some assessments on this person, you see that in, cer in certain aspects, their deficits are so severe that they're functioning at the level of the same age as this kid, 13 or maybe even lower. And the biggest deficit, of course, is the emotional, the social, emotional interaction. So it makes perfect sense that they're chatting. And I don't think it's a harmful. It's it's a, like two kids, like two buddies who bond online. And that happens all the time. Now, the problem is this kid, this 13-year-old, is savvy. He's 13 going on whatever, 20. My client is... 19, almost 20, probably going on 12. I mean, he doesn't function. He barely graduated high school. He's not working. He's online all day. He's not doing anything. He doesn't drive. He's just completely dysfunctional. And that's a big problem with autism because a lot of people say, oh, he's high functioning or he's got mild autism. So it's not really any big deal. It is a big deal because it's a hidden disorder, which means just because they, they're excelling in one area, they don't, you don't know how badly deficient they are in other areas. And it's easy to mask those deficiencies. And if nobody's getting them the help, the counseling, the supervision, the interventions that they need, it's a recipe for disaster. And I suppose that's my first takeaway. This young man has an amazing mother. Amazing. She would jump in front of a bus for him and move heaven and earth to get him the help and anything he needed. But she didn't know what she didn't know. And she was distracted and she left this kid to his own devices. And so he befriends this kid, this young person. And this young person is very savvy. To this day, we'll never know the full story of this quote unquote victim. But what we do know is one kid is on the East Coast, the victim's on the West Coast, and he is online saying things like, I'm being abused, I'm gonna be sex trafficked, I'm starving, I'm desperate. And so our guy wanted to help him, so he would give him DoorDash here and there, send him food to his house, things like that. Now, of course, for all the cynical people out there, you'd look at that and say, oh, that's grooming behavior. No, these are two peers, two very, very vulnerable, essentially kids online. And so the 13 year old's working the 19 year old and telling him all this stuff. And 19 year old turns 20 at some point. So now it's 20 and 13. But at some point, the 13 year old says, it's so bad. I'm in so much danger. I'm in such harm's way. I'm going to run. I, I got to run away. And our client first plan was to call the police, help get some help for this kid. But the kid convinced him, don't do that. 
because they'll just take me out and put me in foster care again. And the last time I was in foster care, I was completely abused, blah, blah, blah. So that plan is not going to work. So our client says, well, maybe I'm going to go fly across the country and rescue him. And that's a preposterous plan because this kid barely wants to leave the house. How is he going to fly across the country, let alone figure out how to intervene in a dangerous, potentially violent situation? He hasn't the first clue. He bought a ticket. He even went so far as to buy a ticket. But he hadn't the first clue about what he would do and how he would go about doing that. He was probably very anxious and scared about it. So he didn't do that. And then not too long after that, he gets frantic texts or whatever online. I did it. I ran away. I'm on the streets. Help me. And so our client uh, buys him a plane ticket and says, you come, come to me, come to the, come east. I, I will help you. And so he buys him a plane ticket. Now, this is a 13 year old kid who finds his way to the airport and is an unaccompanied, I, I don't know how he gets through security and everything else. Apparently, uh, you can't do connecting flights without like parental consent. So the kid flies to three different places before he ends up getting to the town where my client lives. My client picks him up at the airport, takes him home. Mom was not living at, at the home at the time. She was living in a second home or, that she was renovating. So again, again, two kids left to their own devices. And um, my client was not sexually experienced. This young person apparently was because there's experimentation that goes on, all initiated by this 13 year old boy. And so there was some sexual contact uh, enough to implicate very, very serious state statutes. Never mind that this is just about chronological age under the law, but when you look at the functional ages of these people, it's the disparity is flipped. The young person is functionally older than the older person because again, of a recognized developmental disability. So he gets arrested, but he gets bonded out. So he's at home. They hire some fucking lawyers they see on the back of a bus bench. You know those lawyers. They, uh, do you see all this lightning behind me? I'm in Oklahoma, like I said, and I hope a tornado doesn't come, but this lightning and this gloom outside the door are really, it's very apropos of my mood right now. I hope this is not too indulgent. It's the first time I've ever just done this on a podcast where I just went off, so here I go. I've done little TikToks, if you want to see some of my little rants and raves, but those are only a minute long. Um, this is, this is not that. Anywho, so where was I in this story? Oh yeah, so there's some sexual play between two essentially kids. And of course, nobody was hiding anything. There's DoorDash records, there's whatever. So it didn't take long for the cops to knock on the door. And uh, my client answers and fearing that you know, they're going to take him back into this abusive, horrible environment. They ask him, you know, is this kid here? And he says, no, he lies. He lies. And he did it again to, to protect his friend, his, his, the only friend he has in this lifetime, by the way, the only friend he ever had in this lifetime. Eventually the cops convince him, look, we're just here to do a welfare check. We just want to make sure. He's okay, and then he says, yeah, he's here, come on in. And then, of course, the whole process ensues. Now, one thing you need to know about kids, people on the spectrum, and I hate to generalize, but it's pretty true, uh, lying is not their specialty. They don't have the wherewithal to be, to have that much guile, to be that manipulative. And so when they start asking my client about, well, did you do anything sexual? Yeah, he tells them. He's very honest about it. 
And the kid actually denied it because the kid knew better. Why? Because this 13 year old boy was way experienced beyond his years. And he clearly had plenty of experience in the system and he clearly knew how to play this game and get what he wanted out of people who were older than him. So he lies and said, oh no, we didn't do anything. Eventually the cops say, well, he already said it happened. You better tell me. And he, he told him, but he said it was 100% consensual. I was not forced into doing anything. And I'm grateful for this person. He is my best friend. He's helped me out. And you know how he described our client, the 20 year old? He called him a sweet little boy. He's just a sweet little boy. And what do the fucking police do with this sweet little boy? They scoop him up and they put him in jail. Because, you know, the law is the law, I guess. They don't, they don't have to understand nuances like autism or developmental disabilities or anything. No shades of gray when it comes to the cops. No shades of gray when it comes to the prosecutors. This is the law and you broke it. So he gets bonded out of jail, thank God. Uh, but he gets these lawyers from the bus bench lawyers, I'll call them, the back benchers, the bus benchers. And you know, they're really, it's a small little town. Everybody knows everybody. And they take a flat fee to represent. And I got a problem with flat fees. I, this may be a digression, a digression, but here's what happens. They're great lawyers, ethical lawyers, wonderful lawyers, and they're not. And there are a lot of knots. And you give them a flat fee up front, which means I'm gonna pay you X amount, let's say $30,000. And that's the fee. You know, maybe if you end up going to trial, they will say, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna have to charge you more. But basically, that's the fee. And for the unscrupulous lawyer, what does that do? It creates an incentive to settle the case with a plea bargain and do the least amount of work possible. Maybe you put in 10 hours. Maybe you put in 20. Maybe you put in 30. Well, guess what? You just got paid $1,000 an hour for the work that you did if you did 30 hours work on a third. And I don't, I don't, uh, I don't like that. And what you need to do is be very, very cautious, especially with charges that are really, really serious. Because if a lawyer is charging you a flat fee and it's cheap and your charges are serious, you're gonna get fucked. I guarantee it. If a lawyer's charging you an exorbitant flat fee, it's probably because they're very experienced and they know the work that's going to go into getting you the right result. That means hours and hours of their efforts. It means hours of staff doing investigation and legal research. It means hiring experts. It means meeting with the prosecutor. It means putting forth a comprehensive settlement package. These things that take a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of resources. And if you're not getting charged through the nose for a serious case, you know they're not doing that work. They're gonna come at you and say, this is the plea, you better take it because if you go to trial, you're gonna get a lot, lot worse. And guess what? That's exactly what happened in this case. And the client's mother reached out to me and I think they, he had already pled guilty. He already pled guilty to something that was gonna land him in prison for probably minimum of 15 years or something like that. And this is a 20 year old boy. I mean, he's probably 130 pounds soaking wet. He's socially awkward. He's naive. He's vulnerable. He, I mean, he, can you imagine what life is gonna be like for a kid like that? Now they didn't know much about autism. Uh, there was a diagnosis somewhere out there, but they, they don't know a lot of lawyers. I've t talked about this on many podcast episodes. I'll put those links in the show notes, but essentially autism is the great unknown in my legal community. There are so many lawyers, even the best ones, even great ones who haven't, they don't know what they don't know when it comes to autism. They don't know what it is. They don't know why it matters. And these lawyers were the textbook case of that. Not great lawyers. 
but they certainly knew nothing about autism. And so mom's been looking for answers frantically everywhere online. And she heard the podcast and she heard some of the autism stuff and she's decided to give me a call. And um, I came on as a consultant to kind of give my assessment and see if I could help. It's always a red flag when the client's calling me or the client's family because then there's an issue that maybe the lawyers aren't doing a good job. And so when it's time for me to interact with those lawyers, they didn't ask for me. And the good lawyers, the confident lawyers, the brilliant lawyers, they may not have asked for me, but they're at least open to what I have to say. And they may tell me I'm full of shit. That's fine. I can handle it. Um, but they, most of them are pretty happy to have the perspective. Um, but these lawyers weren't. They didn't want anyone second guessing them, uh, undermining them. You don't know how it works here. This is a small town. There's nothing you could do. They pled into everything. And they even pled them to this charge about transporting when there's a valid defense about when someone's in danger. I mean, it was just such shoddy fucking work. And they had tried to settle the case, but by they, I mean mom. Mom, again, being a fierce advocate, and she's brilliant. You know, she she put together a mitigation package, but it was, she didn't know mitigation. She's not a lawyer, so it was just a stack of papers. And she gave it to the lawyers. I'm sure she gave it to the lawyers, hoping that the lawyers would take the information and fashion it into something persuasive and, and organized and, you know, store narrative based. They didn't do that. They just submitted this stack of shit to the prosecutor that didn't explain anything or help anything. I mean, it was the most, I'm sorry. It was the most garbage lawyering I think I've seen in, I don't know how long. And, um, I'm sure they meant well, but they had no business taking this case and they did serious damage because they had pled the guy and now I've got to come in and try to undo, unravel the whole thing. Well, eventually those lawyers got off the case and, and they did it in a really horrible way that I think was damaging to the case um, and telegraphing to these good old boys network that, you know, that something was off, whatever. Um, and so what did I do? Um, well, we got a, we bought a lot of time and we, we worked the case up the way it should be worked up. And I didn't do the lion's share of that work. Part of what I do for lawyers is help them find experts and, and the, put the team together. I guess I'm a coach. I'm a consultant. I say, you need this expert to do a proper autism evaluation. And so we found a world-class expert to, to do that and write a comprehensive report and give amazing testimony in, in a hearing. There was an issue about competency. This kid, he, he had such bad social skills. There was not, any, not even a, a conversation that could be had with him. And what I found with these old crap lawyers is, because I sat in on some of those meetings on Zoom and it was like, they were talking to the mom as if the mom was a client and the client was there. He never spoke a word. So when I was on those calls, when that would, when that was done, I would say, Hey man, to the client, like, do you get, did you hear all that? Yeah. Well, could you kind of tell me what, what you, you know, take, what's your takeaway from that? Or how do you feel about that? And it was like, okay, I guess. I mean, one word answers. So it was clear that this client, if he was understanding, because he wasn't dumb, he's a smart, sweet, smart kid, but if he was understanding, he had a complete failure ability to communicate his thoughts, his feelings, the facts, anything to his counsel. And now that's a competency issue because not only do you have to understand your the proceedings, you have to be able to assist your counsel in your defense. And if you can't communicate with them, how are you able to assist? So, you know, we recommended a competency hearing. Um, we had, you know, crafted the narrative. There was all of this investigation 
that was never done. I mean, how do you have a case with multiple counts of sexual offense that could land a person in jail for decades that'll put a person on the sex offender registry that will completely ruin their life and not do a proper investigation? When I was doing trial work, thank God I don't have to litigate anymore, but when I was and I had an issue where I thought the kid, the victim was had a motive to uh, fabricate or there was something going on there that really put the whole thing story in proper context, you know, I would dig into that. I would subpoena the CPS records. I would subpoena the juvenile records if they've been in trouble. There's, there was a whole wealth. Listen, the most simple thing in the world, which was to get the chats from the online platforms where these kids were communicating. So you could see how this 13 year old is manipulating this vulnerable kid on the spectrum and asking him for food and telling him that he's being sexually trafficked and all that. They didn't even ask for it. They never even made the request for the chat logs. Time passed because this case dragged on for a couple, three years, and those things just disappeared. The state says, oh, yeah, we don't have them. And they went to the internet provider and, you know, we don't keep the whatever. I mean, they fundamentally fucked every aspect of this case up and just went in hat in hand and say, please let us plead to everything. Please, let us plead to everything with no agreements. That sounds great. And I don't think that the, the lawyers are ever going to listen to this podcast. But if they do, they know who they are. And they're going to be super pissed that I'm saying all this stuff about them. And I'm not going to name any names. But you should be ashamed of yourself for what you did to this kid and this family. Thank God I don't deal with lawyers like that hardly ever. Because most of us know better. But anyway, they fired they fired the client. They kept the money, of course. They <laughs> kept the fucking money. Um, because you know, flat fees earned on, on receipt. It's not like a retainer where you actually have to account for your time that you've spent in this case. Um, but anyway, we found some new lawyers and they were local lawyers and they're very competent, capable, good lawyers and cared a lot. And they understood, they understood what they understood and they understood what they didn't understand. So they were very grateful to have the, the insight on autism and other things that they maybe didn't have that much experience with. And there were no ego there and they were completely receptive. And so we had world-class autism expert to tell the story to the judge about what it is, why it mattered. We had a prison expert who would talk about how much danger of abuse of every horrible form this kid would suffer if he had to go into the State Department of Corrections with a sex offender charge, being on the autism spectrum and being very, very, um, you know, slight in stature and shy and everything else. It's a recipe for disaster. And that's exactly what this expert testified to. You know, this is the other thing lawyers don't quite understand, and you need to, which is you have to walk the walk for sentencing. In other words, if your client is out of custody, because it's hard to do in custody, you have a golden opportunity at redemption um, oh, that sounds like the Paul Simon song. You can call me out. I want a shot of redemption. Don't want to end up a cartoon in a car. Well, okay. <laughs> My point is, get fucking help. If you're charged with a sex offense and you're out on pretrial release for, I don't know, a year, maybe two years, which was this case, and you haven't done anything to fix that which is not functioning in your life that allowed you to make these bad choices, what does that say about you? You're gonna, if any good lawyer is gonna go in there and say, well, when it comes to sentencing, you gotta say sorry. You gotta make sure the judge understands that you have remorse. But judges hear that all the time. And if you haven't done anything to show that you have remorse, 
how far is that going to take you? And these original lawyers didn't have the wherewithal to consider, hmm, maybe we ought to get some help. Maybe we ought to get you into counseling. Maybe we ought to work on trying to get you in school or, you know, get a job or something that shows the judge that this case meant something. And it was a wake up call and it changed your life and you're going to be okay. You don't have to worry about me because now that I know what's wrong and how I got into this mess, I'm going to do everything possible to make sure it never happens again. And if you think a judge doesn't want to hear that, well, you're missing out because they do. Fundamentally, judges are human beings and they have to take in a variety of factors. And one of them is, are you going to be a dangerous person? Are you going to reoffend again against a child, no less? And as a lawyer, if you haven't done your part to try to help your client get the help they need, you are failing. You're falling down on the job. Now, because I have contacts and I do this all over, I had the perfect person for this young man who is trained in counseling. And it's not just talk therapy where we work through this. It's it's behavioral. It's it's cognitive intervention. It's um, applied behavioral analysis, or whatever you call it, ABA, all this stuff. There's something called neurofeedback where they actually can do look in, in your brain and see which parts of your brain are functioning, need help, and retrain your brain to help you in the way that you think and, and process information. Like, I know it's a lot, but I'm, you know, I'm not saying you ought to do that in every case. But all I'm saying is I had the perfect person and she worked with this kid a hundred sessions by the time he got to sentencing. And so we had experts, we had counseling. This kid had, his life had changed because of all the interventions and he really was a completely different person than the child the emotional child that committed this offense. And uh, the lawyers, the new lawyers did a great job. They, they, well, first of all, they were able to get him out of the first plea, the, the plea that they were able to negotiate, you know, was a little bit better. Um, not, it still wasn't great. And that is because through no fault of their own, they did everything in their power to try to get a better deal, but small town prosecutor was just didn't care. He didn't care about any of it. And I can't tell you why. I don't know the guy. I can't pretend to crawl in his, his head and ask, you know, I'd love to sit down and ask him why if you have not a fucking shred of empathy and understanding for this young boy who found himself in this mess. But He's a prosecutor. Some of them are just by the book, black and white, and I don't care. And that's how they function in the world. And those are the worst ones. Those are the ones that make my stomach turn. And they're not every prosecutor. I've worked with great prosecutors. But there are ones that are just not. They're just not. And that is one of the things that kills me about this system. It's a fucking lottery. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a fucking lottery. Who is your judge? Do you have an understanding judge? Do you have an empathetic judge? Do you have a judge who may have a child on the autism spectrum? You never know. When you get the wrong judge, you're in big trouble. Who is your prosecutor? Could be any number of people in that office. And if you get one that is a human being, that has some real world perspective, uh, that understands autism, whatever. They're going to be open and receptive to what you have to tell them. And they're going to work with you. They're going to work with you at plea. They're not going to come in at sentencing and ask for something completely off the charts, unreasonable, and it's going to be okay. And I've worked with prosecutors like that. They're everywhere because they just are, they're human beings. Um, a lot of them, in my home jurisdiction and, in Arizona, in um, the District of Arizona, because I do a lot of work in federal court. And I think there are some amazing people there. Couple exceptions, we won't, won't name names, but the point is it's a lottery. Who's your lawyer? You know, how do you know as a client who's never been in trouble before how to properly vet a lawyer? 
to know if you're getting a bus bench bullshit, you know, take your money, do nothing lawyer or somebody who really, really knows their shit and cares and is going to do everything they can to move heaven and earth to try to get the result that you deserve. How do you know? You're a stranger to this system. I did a podcast a while back with a former client of mine who actually wrote a book called Surviving Pretrial, and uh, his name is Bilal Khan, K-H-A-N, I think. But you can look that up on Amazon. I can put a link in the show notes. But he, we talked about that on the podcast. What? How do you vet a lawyer? What questions do you ask them? How do you know if they're good or not? Um, and so I'll put a link in the podcast show notes, but the book's good too. And if you have questions, ask me, but, um, you know, it's a lottery. They thought they were getting good representation and they didn't, they had horrible representation at the outset. Now, as I said, they got new counsel. Thank goodness. I guess this is what you get when you leave me alone with my thoughts in an embassy suites in fucking Oklahoma City. Anyway, new lawyers, tons of experts, filed a great sentencing memo, helped with the narrative, crafted it, made sure everything was laid out perfectly. What judge couldn't understand that this case was different? That this chronological randomness of the age cutoff. Oh, if you're over 18, then you're guilty. Uh, you should have known better. And everybody under 18 is automatically a victim. That's not how life works. That's how the law works. It's a good starting point. But if that's the end of it, we're all in big trouble. Anyway, flash forward to Tuesday, yesterday, Wednesday. And it's sentencing day. I, I was traveling to Oklahoma, so I was able to tune in on Zoom because it's such a progressive, uh, technologically forward courtroom in this little town that uh, they, they were able to do Zoom. Anyway, I got to watch the whole thing. And I saw the first the lawyers, there were two lawyers for, for the client, stand up and do an admirable job making some legal arguments about whether this enhancement or that enhancement should apply. And then they called witnesses. They called the autism expert. They called the prison expert who's talked about how this young man would be brutalized in prison. He'd be raped. He'd be exploited. He'd be uh, shaken down for money because his family has resources. He'd probably spend most of his time in solitary confinement. He wouldn't get any help, any counseling, any good stuff that he has done there, not gonna be available inside the prison. And uh, nobody knows about autism inside a prison. These people aren't trained to manage a client who's on the autism spectrum. Every minute of every hour, of every day, of every month, of every year would be agonizing. And in the Worst case scenario, he doesn't come home. He never comes home because he's dead. And in the best case scenario, he comes home a, a shell of his former self. He is ruined beyond comprehension. There is no good outcome of a prison sentence for this young person. There is no good outcome. And uh, the expert said that very clearly. And this expert was a high-ranking official in the state prison system at issue. He knew what he was talking about. And he testified that he had originally been paid a pretty modest fee for a certain amount of work. Because like a good expert, they charge an hourly rate and you can see how many hours they work and see whether they were worth the, you know, the time they put into the case. But what he testified to was he felt, excuse me, he felt so passionately about this case about the right result in the case and the advocacy in this case that he far exceeded the, the work that he was paid for. And he wasn't getting paid for any of the extra effort. He was there because he just genuinely needed the court to understand the truth. 
and he was there to tell it and he told it well. And then our client's counselor, the one who he'd been working with for over a hundred sessions, testified about the amazing changes that he had made and the remorse that he had demonstrated by doing the work, right? And so you could talk the talk all you want and say, sorry, but you've done the work. We don't have to guess about whether this is important to you, whether it matters, whether you care, whether you're making an effort. And these, this presentation from these very competent defense lawyers took well over two hours. And then the prosecutor stood up and said a bunch of stuff. He lied about the kid's age, said he was 12 when he was 13. That's a small difference, but he either lied or he just was clueless about the facts, which is curious since the case has been on his desk for years. And he railed against the audacity of the defense to insinuate that this victim contributed to this, you know, offense that he was in any way, you know, a participant and blah, blah, blah. Same old bullshit. Uh, downplayed every everything that the defense said. He talked about the Prison Rape Elimination Act as if, as if that's the cure-all panacea to make sure that nobody who ever goes to prison would ever be the victim of sexual assault because, by golly, we have PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, and this is... And then he says this 100-plus hours of treatment and counseling that he put in was just a callous effort to try to escape a prison sentence. That he didn't do it because he really wanted help or because he had remorse. He just was doing it to manipulate the court. And there were so many offensive thing that, things that came out of this guy's mouth at sentencing, but that may have been the most offensive. Because what do you think this would have said if my client hadn't done that 100 hours of counseling, if he hadn't put in the work? He would say, yeah, this case has been going on for two years and he hasn't even done a lick of counseling. What does that tell you? He doesn't care. He doesn't understand the seriousness. Bleep, bleep, bleep. So you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. And so I'm sitting in the airport with my earbuds in watching this. And I said, okay, there's a mountain of evidence of mitigation here. This has got to go the right way. There's no judge in the world that could hear that this mitigation from these professionals who are so credentialed and such good communicators, and they were speaking the truth, there's no judge in the world that's going to listen to all that and send somebody to prison. Well, I was wrong. And that's why I'm doing this podcast, because I'm, I'm, I've been like in the lowest place in the world. You know, highest of highs when we win, and when we lose, it's bad. And when we lose this bad, it's, there's nothing low, there's no lower feeling. Uh, there's so much, what else could we have done? You know, a, examining every, every little decision, every everything in this case. But anyway, so, you know, two and a half hours go by and the, now it's the judge's turn to pronounce sentencing. And he started talking about some fines and fees and, you know, whether the person was sex friendly, whether the things he was saying would kind of seem like maybe he wasn't going to send him to prison. And just, he just said, yeah, I'm not departing. I'm not doing a downward departure. I'm not doing a mitigator. I'm not sentencing him to the juvenile offender pro. I'm not doing any of that. And he did exactly what the prosecutor asked him to do, which is sentence him to 150 months, 150 months in prison in the State Department of Corrections where he will suffer unimaginable horrors. He didn't, I mean, he listened to it. He didn't care about any of it. And I, was, I completely got the feeling that he came to the bench fully, full well knowing that he was going to do that and it didn't matter what evidence the defense presented. He was going to hammer this kid. This kid. He's now 22, but he's a boy. I don't have any problem calling him a boy. This autistic boy. Whose life is over. 
And I, I'm asking myself, why? What, what, what could possibly have been going on in this judge's head that he would have thought in a thousand years that that was the morally acceptable result? And for the life of me, I don't know. Is it a good old boy network where he's buddies? There's probably six people in the prosecutor's office and he goes to lunch with all of them. I don't know. Is it that his first lawyers fucked up the case so badly that they tainted it, everything that came afterwards? I don't know. Is it because mom spent resources, massive amount of resources to try to get her son the best defense and the best help and the best experts that he needed in a case and he just looked at it as some little rich kid trying to buy his way out of consequence? Is he just a cold, unfeeling, heartless person? I don't know. I'll never know. All I know is that this case was a travesty of justice and I was brought in to try to avoid the train wreck that happened. And sometimes, you know, the truth in this business is no matter how much you know and how much you do to avert disaster, you can't. You can't stop the train from going off the rails. There wasn't one person on the defense team at the end of this case who wasn't doing everything in their power to try to prevent that from happening. And none of us could. And they're all people who are at the top of their game in their various fields and none of them could avert this disaster. And so I don't know what that tells us about the system. It's just fucking random and it's horrible sometimes and sometimes we get it right we have unimaginable highs and ridiculous lows and i gotta tell you man this job is hard sometimes and i feel like an asshole even saying i'm sad or i'm this or i'm that because i'm thinking about my client and where he is tonight alone or with some stranger in a prison cell thinking about what the next, I don't know, 12 to 15 years of his life is gonna look like, or whether he'll even live that long. And I'm thinking about his mom. I got kids. I can't even begin to comprehend what it would be to have a child ensnared in a cold, unfeeling criminal justice system who has developmental, who has autism. And I don't know, every minute of every day, I would be thinking about where's my boy? How is he? What's happening? And it would be fucking torture. So he didn't just sentence my client to 15 years of torture, 150 months, so that's what, my math is shitty. Yeah, it's about, that's about 15 years. 120 is 10. And then another, it's about 13, a little less than 13 years. He didn't just sentence my client to that amount of time. He sentenced his mom to that amount of time. He sentenced his brother to that amount of time. He sentenced everybody that loves and cares for that kid to unimaginable punishment. Why? didn't need to happen. And so why am I telling you this? I think part of it is just for me to get this shit off my chest. And um, I guess maybe there's some takeaways in this about choosing your lawyers wisely and making sure you understand autism and reaching out for help when you need the help. Um, maybe I just want people to know what this job is what this, what we do, this is what we do. This is the weight that we carry. And we do it because we're passionate about the work and we're passionate about justice. And some days are good and some days are just fucked. 
thank you for hanging in there and listening to my to my story. Um, well, I'll be back next time with the our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> I got some good stuff coming up for you. Listen, if you're into this podcast, do me a favor. Go subscribe. Go like. Put reviews. Spread the word. I'm really trying to make sure that as many people can benefit from this as we can. And um, I love that you're listening. We have some really, really dedicated followers, and I just want to keep that going. Anyway, peace out. See you soon. That's it for today, but before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. To you, the listener, for spending time with us today getting set for sentencing. Whether you're a lawyer, someone who could use the help, or maybe you're just a true crime buff who loves the inside scoop on how this whole thing works, I am so glad you're here, and I hope you keep listening. If you're interested in knowing more about what I do, mitigation videos, case consults, live teaching, on-demand educational content, books, articles, all of it, please visit www.dougpassonlaw.com. I'm Doug Passon. Until next time, hang in there. Wait a minute, that's a stupid way to sign up a podcast about sentencing. Hang in there. What's the matter with you, man? I guess they call that gallows humor. Sorry. All right. Well, I will see you next time on Set for Sentencing. Bye-bye.